Hi, I'm Glenn Rogers, and this is Biblical Insights. The title of our video today is, Why Do We Sin? Those of us who spend time thinking about who we are and what we are and, and looking at the human condition realizes that sin is uh, prevalent in human society. It's a fancy word is ubiquitous. It means it's everywhere. It's all around us. Can't get away from it. Human beings are sinful beings. And, and so it's a legitimate question to say, well, why? Why do we sin? Or, or maybe to add, you know, why do we sin so much? Because uh, there's a lot of it. We, we are imperfect people and we sin a lot. So why? Um, we, we want to try to answer that today. Now, there isn't a verse in the Bible that explains in, in concise terms why we sin. So there's no text that I can go to and uh, read that. But there are a, a, a couple of ways that we can think about it and hopefully come up with an answer. An answer that was uh, proposed a long, long time ago, late 4th, early 5th century, um, was put forward by St. Augustine, the uh, great theologian uh, and philosopher that uh, had a lot of, of really pretty good things to say. But when it came to trying to identify why people are sinful, um, he came up with something uh, that uh, I, I think was, was not well thought out. And, and I'm not certain that he was uh, the very first person who suggested anything of this sort. I, I think he probably borrowed it and uh, from some earlier church fathers and he refined it and he gave us probably the most complete statement about it that, and we can you know trace the history of this theory uh, back to him uh, and, and then it gets harder to, to go back further and find it in, in any um, formulated sense but uh, Augustine was uh, a man who, who thought a great deal about sin. He was very upset about his own sinfulness. In his book, Confessions, uh, he engages in, in some very, very serious self-loathing uh, about himself as a young man and the horrible, awful, ugly, terrible things that he did. It was just so much evil and he was so evil. But the fact is, when you look at the stuff that he's talking about, mostly it's all, you know, stuff that's pretty normal for a, a young man, late teens, early 20s, that sort of thing. It was, wasn't really all that uh, very bad or horrible as he seemed to think it was. And so this has caused a number of people, especially people with training in psychology, to speculate that, that maybe he had a, a, an overdeveloped conscience and um, had some, some problematic attitudes uh, about uh, his own self, his, his own self-image. Um, some have suggested he has what's called pathological behavior as it relates <clears throat> to his imperfections in life. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, it's it, it all. I, I think it calls into question, at least at one level, why he came up with the answer that he came up with. But here's what he said. He looked at Genesis chapter three, and as he read there about uh, the serpent approaching Eve and asking, "Has God said that you can't eat of any of the fruit of the trees of the garden?" And her reply was, "Well, we can eat." Of the fruit except for the one tree in the middle we can't we can't eat that uh then then if we eat that we'll die and of course he lied to to eve and said no no you won't he just he just doesn't want you to be wise like he did is he doesn't want you to know the difference between good and evil and okay. so you know you know the story eve basically believed his lies she looked at the fruit it looked good it smelled good she thought well, give it a try 
Uh, so she ate, and then she gave some to Adam, and he ate it. And this was the first sin, and uh, they got themselves into trouble for this. Now, Augustine speculated uh, that this particular sin, this first uh, original sin, uh, resulted in what he called a fall, a fall from grace. In other words, he thought Adam and Eve were, because they were created in God's image, that they were perfect like God. And when they exercised their free will and sinned, they fell from that lofty position and that their fundamental human nature was changed. It was corrupted and they became evil, sinful, incapable of doing or being good. And only when God would step in, in what came to be known as the process of election and uh, change the nature back or in some way assist people in being good, were they able to be good. So what Augustine speculated about and, and, and what he claimed, what he taught, and what was subsequently accepted as the truth and an answer to the question, why do we sin, was that humankind fell from grace and became corrupted and incapable of doing good. And this is why the world is filled with so much evil. <clears throat> now, the question is, is this a good explanation? Well, I, I think it's not. <laughs> Because if you read Genesis 3, and I would encourage you to do that when this video is over, get out your Bible. I didn't want to take the time to read the whole chapter while we're uh, here in this short video, but, but you do it afterward. Get out your Bible and uh, read Genesis chapter 3. And it's very straightforward. You know, Eve took the fruit. She ate it. Hmm, hey, this is good. She gave some to Adam. He ate it. Okay, and then they knew good from evil at that point. And they realized they had sinned, and so they hid themselves from God, and God went and found them, and then he began to hand out punishment, punishment to the man, punishment to the woman, punishment to the, the serpent, and so forth and so on. Okay, go read the thing. First you read the chapter, okay? When you do, see if you find anything there about a fall. And I'll tell you, <laughs> you won't. <laughs> There's no fall in Genesis 3. There's nothing... It, there's, there's nothing there. The Bible doesn't say that in any way. See if you find anything about a subsequent change of human nature, a corruption of human nature. And I'll tell you, again, you won't. There isn't anything in there about any kind of fundamental change in the kind of being Adam was and Eve was. There's just there's nothing there that says they were fundamentally changed from one thing to another because they sinned. It's just, it's just not there, okay? So other people noticed this over the years and they said, hey, uh, Augustine, you know, w w where do you find any of this stuff, you know? And, and so he, he came up with two passages. He found two passages in the Bible that he thought supported this view. One is Psalm 51, uh, David's penitential Psalm where Nathan has gone to him, the prophet Nathan, after David's sin with Bathsheba and, you know, confronted him. And David realizes he's sinned and he's absolutely devastated and heartbroken. And uh, he writes this psalm. And in one place in this psalm, he, he talks about how horribly sinful he is. And he says, from the beginning of my life, I, you know, from the time I was uh, some translations say conceived, as others say from when I was born. You know, I've been sinful my whole life. You know, and, and they think David was teaching a theological truth there that a person uh, is born sinful. Uh, and they would trace this back then to the corrupted nature uh, as the result of uh, Adam and Eve's sin. But what they fail to understand is that that's not what David was doing. And anybody with any training in psychology, 
therapy, counseling, anything like that, people who have talked to people in a, in a professional setting and listened to them describe themselves when, when they've done something that they feel terrible about. Any, anyone with that kind of training and experience will recognize that what David was doing uh, was basically beating himself up over his sin. He felt horrible. He was devastated. He, he just felt as, as low as could be, and he was exaggerating what a horrible person he was for what he did. Okay? Uh, anybody with any training in counseling or therapy would recognize David's symptomatic behavior uh, as emotional hyperbole, uh, pouring out his 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 pain and suffering over uh, him his behavior he was very disappointed in himself and he says I'm just a terrible person I'm a really crummy person blah 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 and the therapist basically at that point would would say okay well now let's think about this um, David was not intending to teach a theological truth in that passage right. And uh, there are other passages that very clearly state, the passage in Ezekiel, which clearly states that sin is not passed on from one generation to another. Uh, you do not inherit sin. The consequences of sin sometimes carry on for many generations, but not the guilt of sin. Okay, each person sins when they are old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, and when they choose to do something that they shouldn't do, then they sin and they're guilty of sin. But sin is not inherited. It is not passed on from one generation to another. So Augustine simply misunderstood Psalm 51. And uh, the other text was Romans 5, where Paul is uh, using a rhetorical device, a comparison between what he calls the first man, Adam, and the second man, Christ, the first man brought sin and death. The second man brings uh, salvation and spiritual life. Okay, and it's just a, a theoretical device. Now, no one suggests that uh, he was wrong in in saying that Adam's sin resulted in death for humanity. I think you have to be careful about how far you go with that. Um, but if you actually look closely there, he says that it was Adam who sinned and brought death. Yeah, but if you go back and read the, the text in Genesis chapter 3, it's, it wasn't Adam who sinned first. It was Eve. Well, why didn't he say Eve sinned? Well, because given their patriarchal view of everything, what women did really didn't matter very much. And so... Um, you know, he talks about Adam being the one who was responsible. Adam did this. Adam was the head of the family. Adam, is there a patriarchal attitude coming through? And so he says, Adam. And yet it wasn't Adam. Clearly, it wasn't Adam. It was Eve. Okay. But Adam gets the blame for it. And, and, and he was at fault. He did sin, just like she did. But he wasn't the first one to sin. Eve did. Uh, Eve was the first one to sin. Um, but Paul's point it is that as as the the first human sin brought physical death, now the death of Jesus brings spiritual life. You see, and there's nothing in that text that talks about a fall. There is nothing in that text that talks about a fundamentally corrupted human nature. It just isn't there. Okay, it's not there. Uh, Augustine came up with a theory. And his theory was simply wrong. Okay, there's just nothing in the Bible that says that. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with human nature. And the idea that human beings can do nothing good unless God steps in and gives them grace uh, through this process of election, as Calvin called it, and, and gives them the ability to be good and do good, that's just not true. Okay, and how do you know it's not true? All you have to do is look around. There are many, many people in the world who do not know God, who do not acknowledge God, who have no relationship with God, and yet they're good people. They do good things. They love their family. They, they care about their neighbors. They're generous. They're helpful. They're nice people. Okay, 
and and the idea that uh, human beings are uh, fundamentally corrupted and bad and cannot do anything good unless God steps in and saves them and then enables them to do something good. That just isn't true. Augustine was wrong. John Calvin was wrong. Okay, now I may have just offended a bunch of people. If you have a Catholic background, you, you might be very offended at me saying that Augustine was just wrong. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend you, but Augustine was just wrong. And so was John Calvin. And if you're of that particular branch of Christianity, then again, I don't mean to be offensive, but he's just wrong. And all you got to do is look around you to see. Okay, so if Augustine was wrong and later subsequently Calvin was wrong about why we sin, then we're still left with the question, why do we sin? And the answer is really quite simple. While Augustine conceived of God as perfection, and if we were created in the image of God, then we were perfect until we used our free will to choose to sin, you know, then uh, that, that's, that's part of the problem, okay? Augustine's conception of God. Perfection is not a characteristic of God. It isn't the kind of being that he is. God is perfect. Okay, now make no mistake about that. I'm not, excuse me, I'm not suggesting that God is not perfect. He is, all right? But that's not the kind of being he is, okay? Perfection is the result of the kind of being he is and his characteristics. The result uh, is that he's, he doesn't do anything wrong. Perfection is a result, but it's not fundamentally the kind of being he is. The, if, if we say, what kind of being is God? And somebody says, well, he's perfect. Well, okay, but that doesn't tell me anything about the kind of being he is. So what kind of being is he? God is a thinking being, okay? God is a mind. God has always existed. In fact, when Moses said, oh, what's your name? Exodus 3, what's your name? If I'm going to go to Egypt and tell them God wants you to, you know, free the slaves, they're going to say, which God? And I got to have a name. What's your name? And God said to Moses, I am. Okay, the Hebrew of that simply means I am the existing one. I exist. It could be translated I am or I am that I am or I will be that I will be. But what it means is I am the existing one. I am the one who has always existed. Okay? Um, and, and it happened, the Hebrew word happens to be Yahweh. All right? He, he exists uh, in a disembodied state. He has no physical form. He exists in every place simultaneously. He knows what can be known. He has the power to do anything that can be done, right? Uh, the kind of being he is, though, is he is a mental being. He is a, an entity that thinks, that knows, that wills, that decides, that chooses, okay? And when he spoke in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and said, we're going to make man in our image. Um, that's what he was talking about. We are in the image of God, not that we're created in his, his physical form, because he has no physical form. Our physical form, our bodies, have absolutely nothing to do with the image of God. It's the kind of being we are. We, we are fundamentally thinking beings. Some people would prefer to call us spiritual beings. Okay, if that word you like better, then call us spiritual beings. I like the word mind or mental beings. Um, but what that means is uh, the the inner us, the real us, the individual identity that I have that makes me different from you and makes you different from me and everybody else, right? Our individual identities have to do with a being that thinks, who is conscious, who, who is aware uh, and, and self-determined, okay? And I am aware of alternatives I have. I chose to wear a dark blue shirt today. 
I could have chosen to wear a light blue shirt. I could have chosen to wear a light brown shirt. I could have chosen to wear a dark brown shirt. I could have chosen to wear a black shirt or a white shirt. I chose this shirt. Why? Well, because I had several alternatives, and this is the one I chose. It's just that simple. Okay? We, we deliberate about alternatives. We make choices. Many of the choices we make are not very important. Okay? Um, what we eat in, in, in the morning or what we eat in the evening. Maybe we have several choices. Maybe we don't have that many choices, but we decide to eat or not to eat. We decide what to eat most of the time. We decide what to drink. We decide what to wear. Those are not terribly important decisions. They're just part of everyday life. But we also make important decisions, whether or not we will lie or whether, we'll not, whether or not we will be truthful and honest, whether we will be kind, whether we will be generous, whether we will endure hardship, whether uh, we will be self-controlled. You see, we have all sorts of, of different choices to make on a, on a daily basis and some of them not terribly important but some of them are really very important and all of it grows out of the fact that we are thinking beings who are aware of ourselves aware of choices we have alternatives we deliberate we choose we will to do this or will to do that right we are intentional beings we have intentions. I am in the process of writing a book right now, and it is my intention to finish that book. Why? Because I am purposeful. I have a purpose. I want to get this book, put it into the hands of people who have questions about Christianity. I'm intentional and purposeful. So are you. We all are. It's part of our human nature. Well, where did that come from? It comes from the fact that we're created in God's image. We are the same kind of beings that he is. The difference is that we are baby minds. We are just baby minds. We're little infants, right? Just as a physical baby is born as a little baby and can't do much of anything, doesn't understand anything, doesn't know anything, and it takes years of growth and development for that child to be able to feed himself and dress himself and learn to read and to write and to think well and to analyze. You see, all that takes years of development, okay? So when we come into this world, we're baby minds. And one of the things about babies is that they are uh, self-interested, entirely self-interested. When babies want something, they scream and cry. And they don't care who they disturb. They don't care who they bother. They want someone to come and take care of them now because they're thirsty or they're hungry or they, they have messed their diaper and they need a diaper change or whatever, right? And, and part of the growth process, and, and as parents, we try to help our children learn not to be entirely selfish or self-interested, but to learn to think about others. And, and you see, part of the growth process is to learn how to control oneself and to make good choices. Well, human beings as baby minds are immature, selfish, just like physical babies, okay? Not because we have a corrupted nature and can't do anything good, but because that's the way babies are and human beings are spiritual babies and we make mistakes. We, we make selfish choices. We do things we shouldn't do because we don't understand. See, that was the thing about Jesus. He, he did not sin. Why? Because he understood. He understood life. He understood right and wrong and good and bad sooner than anybody else. And so he was able to make good choices and he didn't sin. Why do we sin? Because we're selfish, because we're immature, because we don't know any better. But part of the growth process, especially as we realize we're sinful and we want to be forgiven and we want God to help us learn to be better, you see, those things 
uh, come as we begin to grow and develop and begin to understand and we begin not to be quite so selfish and quite so immature. See, that's why we sin, because we're spiritual babies. We don't understand. We make mistakes. But God is willing to forgive us and to save us and to help us learn and grow so that we can be better people. Do you want that? That's what God wants for you. And he'll help you with that. If you'll come to him with a, a, a sorrowful heart, acknowledge your sin, ask him to forgive you, be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, and then let him lead you, let him teach you, let him show you how to live a good life. So we sin because we're just foolish children and we do foolish things. We miss the mark, but it doesn't have to be that way all the time. If we give our lives to God, we can engage or begin the process of getting better and better and better so that we don't sin so much. And the nice thing about the gospel is that the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing so that even though we continue to struggle with sin in our lives because we're not perfect, the blood of Jesus washes away the sin so that we're continually clean and acceptable to God, continually not guilty, and we can enjoy a relationship with God. As you think about these things, I would encourage you to read your Bible, pray, go to church, and may God bless.